but we are committed to the process of managing the actions of the parts of a system rather than their interactions. Now, there are several reasons in addition to the systemic one as to why we ought to stop managing actions and manage interactions. The most important one to rise out of a simple fact which most managers and educators of management ignore. By the way, all the educators of management operate on the principle of divide and conquer. Your courses are not on management, they're on production or marketing or finance or human resources. And the idea is when you know each of those subjects, you'll know management. And it's absolute nonsense. It means you won't know a damn thing about management. You're going to know about production and marketing and finance, but not management. It takes about two years in a corporation of experience to start to get some insight as to what the nature of management is after your so-called education. The other reason derives from the following fact. In 1900, it's estimated over 90% of the people employed in the United States could not do their jobs as well as their bosses could. Now, there are two reasons for this. One is the average educational level of the American worker was three years. They were barely literate. But more importantly, it was the way we structured corporations. You have a group of people who are running drill presses and the foreman retires. You need a new foreman. So you look at the drill press operators and which one did you pick? The best one. So now you've got a foreman who can do drill pressing better than any of his subordinates. Now you need a shop supervisor. You look over the foreman, which one you pick? The best one. And thereby, you develop what's called Peter's Principle. I'm sure most of you know that. Everybody rises in an organization to his level of incompetence. When you finally get a job that you can't do, they won't promote you anymore. <laughs> that was Peter's Principle. Today, it is estimated that more than 90% of the people employed can do their jobs better than their bosses can. And therefore, the nature of management should undergo a fundamental change. I don't have anybody that works for me at the Institute that can't do their jobs better than I can. I can run a computer as well as a computer operator, do statistics as well as a statistician, economics as well as the economist. I can't do any of their jobs as well as they can. Supervision is completely inappropriate. The job of a manager is how to manage the interaction of the subordinates that he has, not to manage their actions. That sounds simple, but we're not organized to do that. To effectively manage interaction, we require a fundamental transformation of both our concept of organization and of management, not mere mild reform. So the first major implication of thinking systemically is that you cannot manage effectively is what, if what you're managing is the parts, and then trying to put the best management of the parts together into what you think is the best management of the whole. I recently had an experience which illustrated this principle in a very dramatic way. One of the three largest consulting companies in the United States was making a presentation to the executive committee of a large corporation with which I've had a long association. So I was attending the meeting, and the pitch went as follows. The head of the corporation, the consulting firm, said to the CEO, he said, you've got 12 factories. They each produce the same products. The only difference between them is the regions that they serve. Therefore, the process is the same in each of them, and that process can be divided into 15 different steps. Now, if we make a table with the 12 factories down the side and the 15 steps across the top, you've got a matrix of 12 by 15. Now, if we do a study of each step required to produce your product and find out which factory does it at the lowest cost, we will determine for each step what's the lowest cost way of performing it. Now, if we make each factory perform each step at the lowest cost, you will save $44 million a year, and it will only cost you $14 million for us to do the study. <laughs> That's what he said. And the CEO turned to me and he said, what do you think, Russ? And I answered with profanity. And so he chose to ignore it, and they went ahead. When I saw him six months later, I said, how did the study come out? He blushed, looked down, and kept walking. He wouldn't tell me. 
I found out subsequently that the most optimistic estimate, the one made by the consultant who had done the study, was that $100,000 had been saved. That was quite a net loss. Why? Because when you take the best parts and try to put them together, you don't get the best whole. It's that simple. But we continue to believe that, and that's what benchmarking is all about. The only thing that should be appropriately benchmarked is a whole, not the parts. You see, the only profession that I know of that has a real understanding of the nature of systems is architecture. And they have it because they're unconscious of what they do. But think about an architect. <laughs> a family comes into an architect and says, we want to build a house. We want three bedrooms, a living room, dining room, and a kitchen. We want a family room, two-car garage. I'd like it all to be on one floor. I'd like contemporary architecture, build it out of redwood, and we'd like it to cost no more than $10,000. <laughs> now, the architect is used to this kind of thing. He says, fine. He asks a couple of questions, says, now go away, come back in a week, and I'll show you some sketches. Now the architect begins. What does he begin with? Does he design the kitchen first, and then the bedroom, and then the living room, and then the bedrooms, and then say, how do I put them together into a house? Of course not. He starts with the design of the house, the whole. When he gets a concept of the whole, he begins to put the rooms into it. And when he looks at it, he says, I can improve the performance of this room. I can make this dining room more usable, for example, by enlarging the house in one direction and decreasing it in another. Should I change the house? Now, the criterion which he uses is perfectly simple. I will only improve the part if it results in an improvement of the whole. And if it doesn't, I will not change the part which is exactly the opposite of what we do in practice of management normally. If a manager of a park comes and says, look, if I get this amount of money and I can invest it, I'm going to get a return of 23%. That's 10% more than the average in the corporation. He gets the money. Because the assumption is that what he's doing is increasing the average rate of return. And it's absolutely false. Because you can increase the average rate of return of every part of a corporation and decrease its rate of return as a whole. It's possible. So most of these panaceas fail because they deal with parts. Take quality management. That's a good example. The origin of quality management goes back to Walter Schuhart at Bell Telephone Laboratories in the 1930s when he de de uh, found out how to use statistics to detect defects in the production process and then a way of diagnosing them to find the cause and correcting for them. So you could, over time, eliminate the defects and unnecessary variation so as to get a process performed more effectively. That carries over today. If you look at what most total quality management programs do, they focus on identifying what's wrong, finding the cause of the error, and removing it. Now, if you reflect on it, you know, that's sheer stupid. Although it makes common sense, but uncommon sense is frequently stupid. Why? When you get rid of what you don't want, you do not necessarily get what you do want, and you may get something you want a lot less. It's that simple. Now, anybody ever watches television knows that. <laughs> You go into your living room, turn the television set on, what's the chance you're going to get a program you want? Well, you probably haven't calculated it, but being a, sort of a statistician, I have. I've got it accurate to two decimal places. It's 0.01. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with arithmetic, that's one out of 100 times. It's very easy to get rid of a program I don't want. All I have to do is turn the channel. What's the probability I will get a program I want? It's still 0.01, which means I've got roughly a 50-50 chance of getting something I want even less. Now, if you look at the solutions to most of our social problems in this country, they have been directed at identifying the cause of a defect and trying to remove it with uniform failure to remove it and uniform success in creating a substitute problem that's worse than the one they tried to solve. This afternoon, I gave a couple of examples. 
the most familiar one to most people is the way we treated alcoholism in the 1920s. That was a defect. We wanted to get rid of alcoholism. We said, what's the blame? The answer was clear, alcohol. And so we passed the Volstead Act, Prohibition. Didn't get rid of alcohol, it just illegalized it. It was still plentiful. But that wasn't the problem. The real problem was it created organized crime, which we didn't have up until then. And organized crime has been a much bigger social problem than alcoholism ever was. We did the same thing with drugs in the 1960s. We're the only developed country in the world that legalized all addictive drugs, and we have the highest rate of increase in addiction of drugs of any country in the world. But we continue on that path. It's anti-systemic. You're first of all dealing with parts taken separately, and you're violating the principle that the only way to effectively get what you want is to get what you want, not to get rid of what you don't want. Defect management is not an effective mode of management. Another problem that derives. If you ask most managers what do they spend a good portion of their time, if not the major portion of their time doing, they tell you it's solving problems. Are you aware of the fact that problems don't exist? They really don't. A problem is an abstraction extracted out of reality by analysis. You never experience the problem. A problem is to reality what an atom is to a table. What you experience are tables, not atoms. Conceptually, you have an idea of a table as consisting of a system of atoms. Reality consists of a system of interacting problems. No problem has an independent effect on reality. But how do you go about trying to deal with them? By identifying them and separating them and treating them separately. But when you take reality, break it into problems, and treat each problem separately, you have taken reality apart, you lose all of its essential properties, because it's a system, and the problems themselves lose their essential properties because you've taken them out of the system of which they were a part. We didn't know this until the 1950s, and suddenly we're confronted with a problem we did not know how to solve at that time. How do you deal with reality without taking it apart? We had to invent a method. It's called reference projecting. It's a very interesting method. First, let me tell you what it is. It won't make any sense, and I'll have to illustrate it for you. First. The English language is the only contemporary language, modern language, that doesn't have a word which means a system of problems. Isn't that interesting? In French, they've got a word, the difference between problème and problématique. In Spanish, the difference between problema and problématica. But in English, we don't have one. So we've invented one which seems appropriate, and it's now uh, sanctified as a technical term. The word is mess. <laughs> a mess now means a system of problems. How do you formulate a mess without taking it apart into the problems that it's made up of? By finding out the future that you are now in. Now what in the world does that mean? Well, it means this. You start by making two assumptions that you know are false. The first assumption is that the organization that you're a part of is not going to do anything differently in the future than it's doing right now. It's just going to continue doing what it's doing now. Its current plans, its current policies will be extended indefinitely into the future. That's clearly false, because you wouldn't be even thinking about it if that were true. The second false assumption is you assume the future will change, but only in ways you expect it to. And that's clearly false. Now, if you make those two assumptions and project the future of the organization, every organization will destroy itself under those two assumptions. Why? You've assumed a non-adaptive organization in a changing environment, even though you expect the changes. Doesn't make any difference. If you don't adapt to change, you will eventually destroy yourself. That's what happened to the dinosaur. But what you don't know is how. And that projection reveals the inherent weakness or self-destructive tendency in the current organization. And it's normally so subtle and obscure that I don't know of any other way of seeing it. 